Thank you for being here today. You look marvelous out there. And thank you for supplying these wonderful Easter lilies in honor and in memory of your loved ones. And uh, good, come on down. <laughs> we don't want you to miss it. I want to thank Randy Kennedy for all of his work for helping set up the lilies and those who helped him. Thank you. You know, next Sunday is what we call Low Sunday, and you can guess why. We won't have all of you out here, but I hope most of you will be here next Sunday because we have a very special birthday to celebrate. Our tradition here is that if you turn 80 or above, we like to sing happy birthday to you during the service. Well, our oldest member is having a birthday next Sunday. Uh, Sunday. It's right on the day. In fact, I think she's here today, but I know she's going to be here next Sunday. So please be here to celebrate her 95th birthday. Okay. <laughs> My favorite Easter story in the Bible is the one that Jan read for us today, the one from the Gospel of Mark, which was written around 70 AD, even though this was some 38 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, it was written before any of the other three Gospels. So Mark's account is the one we have of the, is the first account we have of the resurrection of Christ. And the story ends rather strangely and abruptly, very dramatically, which I love, of course, since I'm into drama and theater. We're told that very early in the morning, three women, Mary Magdalene, Salome, and Mary, the mother of James, go to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. On the way there, they ask each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Speaking in Myers-Briggs language, none of these ladies must have had J personalities. <laughs> they all had to be P's. They are planning to work on the body, but they don't know how they're going to get into the tomb. Shouldn't they have figured that out before they left? It's like me and a bunch of guys hopping in a car and going to the masters, and as we're driving to Augusta, we ask each other, how are we getting tickets? How are we getting in? I know how to get out of the masters. <laughs> Just simply show a cell phone and they'll be glad to escort you out. Even if you're a, you are a hundred yards away from the golfers and the playing field, even if you are calling someone who just had a death in the family, they'll show you the exit, believe me. Barney Fife is alive and well and living in Augusta. <laughs> I know how you get out of the masters, but how do you get in? How, who will roll away the stone? How are we getting in? I don't think they're asking which one of them is going to move the stone. Wonder Woman is not in the story. This is a huge boulder. It would take a group of strong men to, to move it. Not only that, it is stamped with a military order. Only someone who has authority can have the stone removed. Pontius Pilate or Herod a Roman officer maybe, or perhaps a high priest could authorize it. So maybe their question has more to do with who are they going to talk to who has the authority to have the stone moved. I don't know, thought they would have had that figured out beforehand. But as you know, to their surprise, they find that the stone has already been moved and they walk into the tomb and are met by a young man dressed in a white robe. Do not be alarmed. Fear not. You are looking for Jesus. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they had laid him. Then the white robe figure promises that the women and Jesus' disciples will see Jesus in Galilee. There you will see him. 
just as he told you. Now this could have been a grand ending to the story. We can almost hear the trumpets blasting notes of triumph and victory. He is no longer here. He has risen. Now go back to Galilee and there you will see him just as he told you the end. But it isn't the end. Mark gives us one more verse. And that one verse changes the entire tone of the story. The text says, the women fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. That's not only how the story ends, it's how the entire Gospel of Mark ends. It'd be the perfect ending for a television show because it leaves you hanging. Can't wait to find out what happens next. Can't wait to find out if he really did rise from the dead. Or did someone steal the body? Who, who was that guy in white? And when, if ever, will the women let the other disciples know what happened? Can't wait for episode two. Some of the early Christians didn't like the ending as much as I did. They didn't think it was the best way to promote a resurrected Christ. Do you know what they did? Years after the story had been written, they added more to the story. Had some appearances of Jesus to his disciples. Those stories are there in the Bible starting at verse 9 of the 16th chapter. But the real story ends at verse 8. They fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. What shook these ladies up? Why did they stay silent? I'm sure many of you saw a story this week that made its way on the news and on the internet about a 66-year-old man named Noah Stafford Noah has been colorblind his entire life. And apparently they now make these incredible glasses designed for colorblind people. When they put on these glasses, colorblind people see color just like the rest of us. Noah had never heard about the glasses, didn't know anything about them. And there is a video that you must see, if you haven't seen it, you must see of the family giving him a pair of these glasses. And he opens up the box and puts on the glasses and within two seconds he is overcome with emotion and he quickly takes the glasses off and he can't talk, he's rubbing his eyes, his crying eyes, and it's like it's too good to be true, and Noah is speechless, he puts the glasses on again, and this time they immediately come back off as he puts his head down and weeps. One of his daughters comes over to comfort him, she understands that he's overcome with emotion over this incredible, unbelievable experience. You hear another daughter in the background who doesn't get it, what's wrong daddy, you don't like them? She doesn't understand that he's just too overwhelmed, just too overcome with emotion to say anything. He puts the glasses on a third time, and again, he has to take them right off. This moment is so powerful that he can't even leave the glasses on. And all he can do is put his head down and weep. And when the daughter who understands comes over to comfort him, he mumbles, it's so clear. I can't believe it. And he puts the glasses on for a fourth time, and this time they stay on for a good while as Noah sees and examines the world in a whole new and exciting way. Maybe that's kind of what's going on with these three women. Maybe the moment is so powerful, so incredible that they are speechless overwhelmed, in awe, they can't talk. But I don't think their reaction is simply because Jesus is alive. Jews believed in life after death. You don't hear Jews talking about that much, but life after death is part of their faith. I didn't know that for a long time. 
When I was growing up, I assumed that the belief in life after death began with Jesus and Easter. But that's not true. And to confirm what I had read, I called our good friend, Rabbi Robert Haas. He said, yes, Jews believe that there is another world. We believe that the soul is eternal. And then he said, but we're taught not to talk about it. I said, why? Because it can get us off track, he said. We're taught to keep our eyes on the ball, to do our best in this world, and let God take care of the rest. I told him that I wished we Christians did the same thing. We put too much emphasis on getting into heaven, and then you have people thinking they're getting in and others are not. So much judgment. And Rabbi Ha said, that's another reason we're taught not to talk about it. Because as soon as we start doing that, making judgments, we're not acting the way God wants us to act. He's preaching for me, by the way, this summer, so be sure to come hear him. So Jesus being alive would not have stunned the women. What would have stunned them is that he is alive and he is loose. Jews believed in life after death, but it was not here on earth. The deceased, deceased could not be seen. They were part of another world. Jesus is alive and he's loose in the world. He's not just in paradise. He's here on earth. In other words, he's back. <laughs> and not only is he back, he's right. Remember, it would take one with authority to move the stone. And so we discover that the one with ultimate authority is not Pontius Pilate or Herod or Caiaphas or any of the high priest. It's not even the zealots who will fight to the death in order to free God's people. No, the one with authority, the one who is able to move the stone is Christ. And you know what that means, don't you? It means that he was right. It means his way of living and what he taught is what we are supposed to do. We really are supposed to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. We really are supposed to offer our left cheek when someone slaps our right one. We really are supposed to take up our cross and follow him. No wonder the women were afraid. That's tough stuff. You know, there's nothing sentimental about Easter. Easter is serious stuff. Resurrection is a demand as well as a promise. Easter demands not sympathy for the crucified Lord, but loyalty to the risen one. That means an end to all loyalties, to all people, and all institutions that crucify. We hear a lot about fake news these days. False news that is given in order to distort the truth or to keep people from focusing on the truth. In a sense, that's what we Christians have done by telling people Jesus came in order to get people to heaven. Jesus rarely talked about life after death. He didn't have to. The Jews already knew there was life after death. This fake news has been very successful at keeping us off the main mission of Christ what we really are called to do, creating the kingdom of God on earth 
That's what Jesus was constantly, constantly talking about. In some places in the gospel, it's called the kingdom of heaven. And the word heaven is not referring to a heaven in the sky. It's just another word for God. Some Jewish writers believed it was wrong to write the word God. So they used the word heaven instead. And so the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same thing in the gospels. Jesus' main purpose was to teach disciples how to bring the kingdom of God on earth. He told them to pray this, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what got him killed. It's been said that the enemies of Christ understood him and his purpose better than most of his followers. What does the kingdom of God look like? What does it mean? It means that the goal for this world is for it to be as though God was king. What would the world look like and be like if God was king? No homelessness. No hunger. No violence. Health care for everyone. Educational opportunities for everyone. Clean water for everyone. It's Isaiah's vision of the peaceable kingdom. Everyone getting along. Everyone connected. Enough for everyone. As scholar John Dominic Crossan told us at January Adventure this year, distributive justice is the very nature of God. And Genesis tells us that we were made in God's image, so we are in charge of creation, and we are to run it like God. Distributive justice, enough for everyone. That's the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And that's why he so emphasized taking care of the least of these. The early Christians got this. They were very good at working for the kingdom of God on earth, very good at distributive justice, very good at caring and loving one another. And so the resurrection of Jesus wasn't so much about, oh boy, we get to live forever. We already knew that. The significance of Jesus' resurrection for the early Christians was, oh my, he was right He is of God. He is the real deal. He speaks truth. We really are supposed to follow what he told us to do. We're to copy him. We're to serve others as he served us. To be a disciple of Jesus means reading the newspaper and asking, what does God need me to do about this problem? It means looking at our church and community with the question, how does God want to use me? It means going to school or work or play and saying, how can God be present through me today with the people that I meet? It means getting up each morning and praying, God, show me how you will use me today. And so Easter brings with it Great, great expectations. And the early followers of Christ must be thinking, if this Christ has authority and is loose in the world, he will expect us to act a certain way. But will that mean we will have the same fate that he had? Will we be arrested and tortured and killed? No wonder they're scared. Or they may be thinking, will we be able to do it? We let him down already. We let him down once before. We abandon him. Will we be able to fulfill his expectations? This past September, I did a funeral for one of my football coaches, Doyle Kelly. I'm sure some of you know, knew Doyle. I was about to say that Doyle was a good friend, but it's hard to call a coach a friend. 
It's a unique relationship between player and coach because a coach has authority in your life and his job is to teach you, to push you, to help you be your best and to get the best out of you. And so you develop a close relationship, but at times the relationship can be challenging and even intimidating. The head coach of my high school football team was a man named Bubba Atwood. Some of you knew Bubba. Doyle was the assistant coach. Bubba was in charge of the offense, and Doyle was in charge of the defense. I played on defense, so even though Bubba Atwood was my head coach, I spent most of my time practicing and working with and under Doyle. Doyle was known for being a very tough coach. There were times when I and other members of the defensive team would be upset with him, felt as though he was pushing us too hard. One of the goals I made for my life when I was very young was to be part of a state championship team. I didn't know my father. He died when I was four years old, but I knew that he had been on a state championship high school team. So at a very young age, I had the desire to be on a state championship team. It's hard to explain, but it was something I could do to somehow feel connected to my father. State championships don't come easy, but through the hard work and gnashing of teeth that Doyle forced me and my teammates to experience, we were blessed to win a state championship. I was also selected to be on the all-state team at my position. What I experienced under Doyle Kelly's tutelage in football not only was a tremendous blessing for me in high school, but the work ethic and the idea of what was possible helped me in my career as an actor and as a minister. In fact, in some form or fashion, Doyle Kelly had a lot to do with the resurgence of this church. Did I like being pushed by Doyle? Absolutely not. Did Doyle scare me? Absolutely yes. Did Doyle love and care for me? I believe so. Did Doyle help me to have a more meaningful, fulfilling life? You bet. My junior or senior year, Doyle told me that he loved a particular song and he said, Billy, when I die, I want you to sing it at my funeral. We joked about it during my high school years, and every so often he would remind me, and even after I graduated and left the school and I'd bump into him in Savannah, he'd point to me and say, the song. I moved to New York, moved back in 1993. Once in a while, I'd bump into Doyle at Sam's or somewhere. He'd point to me and say, the song. And so I sang the song at his funeral this year a song he had been asking me to sing for 40 years. It did surprise me that this was Doyle's theme song. It's how he tried to live his life, and it's how he hoped and expected his players to live their lives. And I think it's how the risen Christ hopes and expects you and me to live our lives. Because the risen Christ is not on the loose just to be loose. He is loose to push you. He is loose to help you be the best you can be. He has great expectations for you. And he knows not only can you and I do it, he knows that it's for our own good. And for the world's good. And it's the only way to experience life in its fullness. To dream the impossible dream 
to fight the unbeatable foe. Come on. 